episode 29, Things I Thought I'd Never Do. Welcome to the Visionary Variety Podcast, where we cover all kinds of cool stuff like photo, video, film, books, and technology. So switch on your brain and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Visionary Variety Podcast. This is Daniel Grove, your host, one and only host today. I am going solo. We're going to talk about some business-related things, uh, about growth and challenging yourself, creativity, innovation, as well as some examples from my own personal journey as a photographer, just learning new techniques and learning new markets and learning to make new products and not get stagnant and not get left behind with culture and technology, but to stay fresh and stay new and you know basically provide a product product that people want and are willing to pay money for. Uh, but before I get to that, there is some cool stuff coming up and things I am into right now. Uh, San Japan is a major convention that's coming up. It's at the end of August into September 1st and 2nd, and that is definitely on my radar lately. I've been working on all the mini shoots that I'm going to be doing. Uh, so in case you guys don't know what I'm talking about, uh, San Japan is an anime convention that happens in downtown San Antonio, kind of like Comic-Con, but not comics, anime. And thousands of cosplayers show up and do awesome stuff, and there's a bunch of things happening inside the convention, but I am outside doing photos pretty much all day long, and it's actually really fun, and those are some of my best work comes out of those little shoots. So what I do is I schedule a bunch of cosplayers ahead of time. Uh, they each have their own little time block of, of 20 minutes, and I pick a location, and we make amazing photos in 20 minutes, <laughs> and then and the next 30-minute block hits, and it's the next person's turn, and I go to the next location, and yeah, so th that just goes on from about 8 a.m. to like 2 p.m. Currently, I think I have about 23, 24 mini photo shoots scheduled uh, spread across the Friday and Saturday of San Japan. So that's going to be intense. And if you are a videographer or a photographer and want to come and help just for fun and for learning purposes, uh, I would be very glad to have you along with me. <laughs> There's always a need for an extra hand to move a, move a flash or adjust a costume or whatever. And it is a really great opportunity to learn photography, learn portraiture, learn how to interact with clients, pose them, and do lighting and stuff like that. So uh, let me know. Uh, email me, message me on Facebook, whatever, if you want to get on board with that. I believe Nate will be with me videoing some of it and helping. I've got another videographer who's going to come and record just as practice for himself. But also, hey, I get some cool footage of me doing my thing. Um, and I've got some other photographers interested in coming and being a, some helping hands with that, which is awesome because the more people you have involved, the easier everything is and the more fun it all is. So anyway, Saint Japan's coming up and I'm super excited about that. Uh, not excited about the sleepless nights. I'm going to be editing photos for about a month straight. But at the same time, I like that too. It's super fun. And speaking of photography, I unfortunately had to buy a new lens. <laughs> my 50 millimeter 1.4 got dropped by my son. Uh, thanks a lot, Azariah. And it just sustained some damage, which renders it uh, incapable of focusing any closer than about 10 feet, which basically makes a 50 millimeter useless in, in a lot of ways because it's great for close-ups and portraits and even some macros and stuff like that. And yeah, I can't focus close. I can only focus far away. Very annoying. So I looked into the repair of it, about 200 bucks, and I got to send it off to Canon, which means I won't have a 50 millimeter lens for like three weeks. That's just not okay. And you know, this lens is about 10 years old. The focus isn't that great, so I think it's time to retire it and move on to something new. So I don't have a lot of money right now to spend. So what I did was instead I bought the 50 millimeter 1.8, uh, the STM, and this is uh, a newer lens from Canon. I think it might be a year or two old, which is uh, still new in, in terms of lenses. And this is a really great, very cheap 50 millimeter lens. It's only 120 bucks. All right, what else is going on? I have been listening to some audiobooks lately. Surprise, surprise. I'm pretty much always listening to audiobooks, but I've got a really cool one that I'm not finished with, so I don't know how it's going to end. I'm not going to spoil it for you because I can't, but it's pretty interesting. It's called The Book of Strange New Things by Michael Faber, or Faber, I don't know. Uh, this is a sci-fi book, uh, as should be expected from me, and it's about a Christian missionary who goes to a distant planet to witness to aliens. And when he meets them, he gets an unexpected surprise. So very cool. Um, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I like the idea of aliens, which will be our next episode, I hope. And yeah, so this is a really cool different take on that. I feel like it's kind of a topic that really hasn't been addressed a lot. 
I hate when people separate religion and science or Christianity and sci-fi like they just cannot be in the same room together. That's ridiculous to me. And I hope to change that myself with some books in the future. Maybe one day I'll sit down and write some. It was always fun when I find a book like this, and it turns out to be really well written, and I'm enjoying it very much. Another book that I am just about two hours away from finishing is The Last Shot by Daniel Jose Older. And this is a Star Wars canon book about mostly about Han and Lando. And it takes place, for the most part, this book is kind of interesting. It jumps between three different times, uh, past and then far past and then current day. So current day in this book is a few years after episode Episode 6. And little Kylo Ren, formerly known as Ben Solo, he is actually a little baby. I think he's two years old here. So this is, you know, maybe not 10 years after episode six, but maybe four. I could see a pressure, maybe three, four, five years later. And yeah, little Ben, little Ben Solo's throwing little force tantrums. No, he's not actually, but he is throwing tantrums. It's a cool story because it deals with droids and AI and sabotage and also some cult stuff going on. Uh, things you don't really get too much of from the Star Wars universe, so, except for sabotage. But uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. It. Of course, Mark Thompson is the best Star Wars narrator of all time, of all galaxies, and he is, for the most part, narrating this book. It's sort of weird. It jumps back in time to tell, tell kind of a backstory, and it changes narrators. Then it jumps back again and, and has a different narrator, and I, I personally don't really like that. The guy, the other voices are not as good as Mark Thompson's, and it just kind of throws me off. And one guy doesn't really imitate voices, and then the other vo- the third voice is a woman who does a good job, and she imitates them, but it's not Mark Thompson. It's just weird. I don't know. Just keep one narrator for one book or have a different narrator for each character. That's what I prefer. So anyway, I'm about to finish that, and uh, I guess I suggest that if you, if you want an interesting um, read that's in the new Star Wars canon. All right. Well, enough of that. Let's move on and talk about this episode. So... The idea for this episode came from a little bitty revelation that I had recently where I was just thinking about my business, thinking about my photography, where I'm going, where I came from, and what my future is. Many of you may not know this, but I am transitioning my business model from uh, what is negatively called shoot and burn (laughs) to what is intimidatingly called IPS. So shoot and burn is the photography business model. Uh, often a lack of a business model, that basically a client is paying you for digital images. So you shoot photos, and hopefully, I'm praying you edit them before you deliver them. And I'm praying you cull them and not deliver all the photos. Please never do that. One, never deliver unedited photos. And two, never deliver all the photos you take. Bad, bad conduct, bad business <laughs> model. Don't do that. All right, moving on. So shoot and burn is that. They pay you for maybe 20 photos, maybe 50 photos, maybe one. I don't know. And you edit it. I pray that you do. And you deliver that. And that is your product. You're done. You've got some quick money. And they have a digital image. Who knows what they're going to do to that image? Uh, but they have it. And they will do something with it. <laughs> Hopefully they just post it and tag you on it. But IPS is not necessarily the opposite, but it's a different route for making money through photography as an art. And IPS stands for in-person sales. So this is a a very different approach to photography sales in that you do a photo shoot, and typically they don't get anything. They don't get any digital images. They don't get any prints, nothing for just the payment of the photo shoot. But where the money comes in later is you meet them in person. Huh? Get it? In-person sales? And you, guess what? You sell them stuff. Yeah, you sell them prints. You sell them possibly even digital images, various high quality products like prints, canvases, wall art, photo albums, whatever. And yeah, it's very profitable for those photographers who have great art that people want. And for those who, you know, have the clientele that has money to spend on things like this. And that's the route that I'm going. Honestly, I've just kind of looked at my last year and it's like, hey, like something's missing. I mean, I'm doing everything I can. I'm thinking I'm working hard. I have got great work, I think. A lot of my work stands out as unique in this area. But I'm just not able to pay my bills with it. And this is not my only job yet, but I do plan on going full time with photography. Uh, Who knows? Maybe next year, depending on how this whole thing goes, this transition of business model and this kind of new training that I'm getting from Jim Landers of Jim Landers uh, Photography and Photography School. He's a really awesome guy here in San Antonio that teaches photographers how to become more profitable through the IPS business model. He also teaches lots of other really great classes about wedding pricing, uh, photographic technique, and business plans, and all kinds of different stuff. So if you want to take your photography business to a new level, check out Jim Landers Photography School. He's, he's also just a great guy on his own. Um, not like <laughs> he also he didn't pay me to do this. 
I just off the, off the top of my head right now, I'm just like, you know, I'm going to plug him because he's cool. So there's that. Um, I'm going through a major transition with that, which a lot of it is mindset and just outlook and perspective of how I see my art and its value and how I want my clients to treat my art and how I want them to value it and make sure that it's not sitting on a hard drive, getting lost and deleted and corrupted and then eventually just totally out of their possession. Um, where are my images going to be? Where are your digital images going to be in 5, 10, 30 years? Ooh, that's a scary thought, right? We don't know. There's no way to know, but probably not on your computer <laughs> in the far future. That That's just not a pleasant thought for me who pours my heart and soul into these images. And honestly, my clients do love their images. Uh, I, I'm going to say about 90, 95, 99, maybe maybe 100%, <laughs> love their images to death. Uh, that's my goal. And I don't want them to let their images disappear. I, these are memories for them. These are big moments in their life. Most of them are milestone moments that they want to cherish and keep. And I don't want them to disappear. So I am changing my priorities and I am focusing more on prints in my photography so that they can have my photos and they can keep my photos you know, physically in this real world, not in the digital, digital virtual world. And yeah, so anyway, enough about that. Uh, so where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, I am changing my business model. And honestly, IPS business is something I swear I would never do. I don't like trying to convince someone to buy something that they probably don't need. Uh, and likely don't want at first. You know, that door-to-door -door vacuum salesman job is like my worst nightmare. Like, I could never do that because, A, it doesn't sound fun. That's pretty much my my first rule for a job. It's, it's got to be enjoyable. <laughs> and, B, I've got to be totally convinced that they really do need this. Most door-to-door -door sales stuff or multi-level marketing stuff, a lot of that stuff are luxury items or additional things that literally you can live without. You can get by and have a happy life without them. But if you have them and if you're into that, then it will make your life better. So, that convincing someone, trying to sell something, something is something that I just despise. But it's it's different now that I'm getting into IPS. I'm actually realizing that hey, I don't really have as big of a problem selling someone on buying my photos because a I had fun making them, and B, they have already paid me for a photo shoot, so I know that they're into this. If they don't want to pay the photo shoot fee, obviously, if they can't afford that, then, then you know they're not really my ideal client, and I move on. I, I go to someone that, that can and has the money and time to spend on me. Um, that might sound really rude, but it's not. It's professional. And that's, that's how a lot of businesses work, honestly. If you can't afford a Rolls Royce, you buy a Toyota. I mean, hey, if you really want a Rolls Royce, you save up. Uh, or maybe you go into debt. <laughs> I'm not encouraging that, but that's that's how it goes. I'm realizing that it's not as teeth pulling as I thought it might be to con to sell my my photos um, in this context. I'm, I'm already you know I'm already in a business transaction with them, so I realize you know this is something that I thought I would hate. Uh, this is something I thought I would never do. I, I felt like it was dishonest. I felt like it was uh, holding images hostage and forcing them to buy expensive stuff. But it's not that at all. Um, you're selling high-end products that are going to last, they could last 100 years. Digital image? No way. It might even have one year of lifetime of enjoyment. And then the photo's gone, deleted. It's buried in Facebook. It's not even high quality. And honestly, you got to turn stuff on, log on to stuff, remember passwords, you find the folder, open the image on a crappy looking screen, and then you can enjoy it a little bit. And then you're already distracted by something else. If a photo is hanging in someone's room, in their home, in their business place, totally different story. I mean, it gets enjoyed every time someone walks by, even at a subconscious level. That's what decoration is. People don't stare and look at a decoration. But if there was no decoration there, ugh, it's just a boring wall, boring house, you know, no, no flavor, no color, no attitude. Um, and on, on top of that, you know, a photo is, is I mean, it's pictures of people. I think we want to look at pictures of people instead of pictures of, you know, a texture or an inanimate object. Um, so, yeah, anyway, <laughs> getting real deep here. I believe that there is value in printed photos, and that is something that I'm learning about and trying to build my business around. So I started looking deeper into myself. I'm like, you know, I said I'd never do this. Here I am doing it. Uh, what else have I done like that? Have there been other things that I hated or, or ran ran away from and I ended up doing it after all? Yes, and this is sort of weird. So when I started photography, I was the classic, typical natural light photographer. I just use a sunset. I just use natural light. I use shade, no flashes, no strobes, none of that fancy studio stuff. I wanted natural beauty in my photos. Um, as if when you use a flash, there's no longer natural beauty. <laughs> so I never, I, I, I really just didn't want to use flash. But um, I eventually got into it because I realized uh, there's not enough sunlight 
a lot of the time, <laughs> or the sunlight's in the wrong place, or the sunlight isn't bright enough, and I can't light up these people's faces, and I don't want to edit the heck out of their skin to make them look normal, because that's just not going to look normal. So I need light. I need more light. So I bought flashes. I got uh, Yagnuo wireless flashes, and man, these flashes just blew my mind. Uh, they have taken my photography, my portraits, my weddings to a whole new level that literally you cannot reach without flash. You can't. You can't be just so good with natural light that you can do any wedding make it look as good as a wedding done with flashes and done well. They just, they can't compare. And this is not a skill thing. This is uh, is science. (laughs) I don't know how to say this. It's hard facts. You cannot light a dark dance floor if you're not using lights. Um, So anyway, I moved into flash photography and I don't use it for every photo shoot. I love using natural light. And in fact, I will do plenty of photo shoots in a row with not one flash used because I don't need it because I plan my photo shoots accordingly. You know, portraits, uh, especially families, maternities, kids, things like that are great looking in natural light. But if I want more of a dramatic look, especially if like, for things like cosplay or maybe a senior or a model where I want it to just really stand out as a dramatic and uh, just a wow image that is, you know, just a different flavor than family photography or normal portraits, I got to use flash. And I love using flash. It's super fun. It makes my images look uh, very unique and, and creative. And it's given me other creative possibilities, such as using color gels to make my flash colored and just make images stand out in, a, in another new way. So learning Flash, once I, you know, I haven't mastered it. I'm not going to say I mastered Flash, but once I got Flash and once I got good at it and proficient and I could make it do what I wanted, my photography went to a whole new level. I was able to make, you know, money on things I couldn't make money on. I was able to shoot events and weddings in ways I couldn't before. So I jumped that hurdle and boy, am I glad I finally got over myself as a natural light photographer. I finally did it. It's awesome. Uh, the next hurdle that I uh, realized, you know, I think it was about two days ago, I was thinking about this. The next hurdle I tackled was composite photo. Photos. A composite is a photo, a digital image composed of different elements. So, for example, a lot of my cosplay photos are a composite. And what that means is I cut the person out of the background. I slap them onto a new piece of ground, a new ground image, say a desert stock image that I got for free with no, no copyright. Um, now, voila, they're standing on a desert floor. Well, now I need a sky. I'm going to get like an ominous, cloudy sky. I find one of those on the stock photo website and use that. And then I need some dust swirling around them, so I get some dust overlays. And then I might even, you know, make, they don't have a weapon in their hand, but they're supposed to have a big sword. So I'll make that in my 3D program, render it, slap it into Photoshop, blend it in, and boom. They're in a whole new world, <laughs> holding something that could not exist in real life <laughs> or they couldn't afford. And that is a composite. It's composed of different elements. Um, They can even be very small and subtle elements like, you know, um, overlays, background, particles, smoke, things like that, that you may not even notice that are there, but they are. So composite photos are something that I had no interest in doing uh, early on in my photography. Why? Because they're a lot of work and that hasn't really changed. But what has changed is that I have learned how to make them look good. Uh, And now I am by no means, you know, mastered this at all. I, I am learning every time I do a composite, I learn something new and I try to implement that in my next composite, which is why I'm continually getting better and better at this is because I look at it as everything is stepping stone towards something better. And that something better when I get it is another stepping stone to something greater after that. And so I never stop learning. You can't, or you'll just sink. You'll just get forgotten about and you won't get any better. And that is unacceptable to me. That does not jive with my mentality of my photography. So once I started doing composites, I think in 2016, I really gave it a hand. I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm not even going to post this. I'm just going to try it. And it looked pretty cool. I I did a few more and learned some new tricks to learn. It was really about expanding my horizons as to what was possible in a composite. You know, it's not just a fake background. Um, It's not just a lightsaber glow. It's just so much more. Like you can tell a story through a composite that is impossible to make in real life. And so I started tackling that. I started learning it, you know, of course, watching YouTube videos and learning other tricks of how people that do it amazingly uh, that I want to be like, how they do it. And here I am now. I don't do composites for all my cosplay photos because that would be ridiculous and I'd have to charge an ungodly amount of money because all the time I would be spending. But if I have a really good photo shoot that goes well, I might do one composite, you know, out of my favorite image and just go to town on it. Just I might spend three hours, sometimes more, depending on how elaborate it is. And um, yeah, I'm really glad I tackled that that hill of, of composite photography and composite editing techniques that at first I ran away from because of the work level. But once I got the return and the value of those amazing images that are unique and that almost no one else in my area can make, you know, it, it turned out to be worth it. And my composite photos are something that really make me stand out. 
Um, I mean, just today I was talking with a friend that I ran into at Starbucks and she said, you know, I love your pictures. They're so cool. She's talking about my comp composite photos. Um, and she was referring to the ones with fake backgrounds. She, she doesn't need to know that they're fake. Of course, she probably will assume when looking at it, you know, <laughs> obviously that spaceship or that, you know, field of swords or that world on fire is not a real location, but it doesn't matter. These are pieces of art that stand out and, and non-geeky, non-nerdy people who know nothing about anime, they'll never set foot in a, a convention, you know, they like these images. And that's a good sign that I'm doing something that stands out. And you know, if she meets someone that's into that, you know who she's going to refer them to? Me, because she remembers my images and she knows me personally and she, she I've, I've, she's hired me for various photo shoots. So all that to say, after getting into flash photography, doing composite photography now, and now, of course, moving into IPS, I'm just kind of trying to see the big picture. And it's almost like I'm thinking, okay, what kind of photography do I hate right now? Because I'm probably going to do it and make money off of it in the future. <laughs> and there's not a lot of types of photography I don't do. Um, so I really rack up my brain to try to think, okay, what am I lacking in? I need to learn that and learn how to make money off of it. I posted this on one of the local photography groups, and my photographer friend, Taylor Odiambo, she wrote, and she said, you know, I never thought I would be photographing products. Um, so this is product photography, like things that people make. You know, it could be shoes, could be a handbag, could be electronics, whatever, whatever the product is, photographing that in, in basically a studio setting and using that for their online sales of that product. That's a very profitable type of photography. If you know the right companies that need great photos to sell their products online, they got to have photos and they need to look professional. So someone's got to take those photos and someone's getting paid for them. Apparently it's Taylor. <laughs> and lots of other photographers do this type. And this is actually a type of photography that I have never really done. So I think it's about time I learn a new trade, I guess. <laughs> so that kind of kicks off this, uh, this idea that to grow in a business, and again, you know, I'm a photographer, I do this stuff, but I'm trying to make this apply to all businesses in a general way. It's kind of a general rule that you need to challenge yourself to grow and learn more. So when you challenge yourself with your business, um, especially if it's a creative you know, thing, of if you're an artist or a photographer, maybe a musician, challenge yourself with new things uh, helps you learn, you know, to do that thing well, obviously. But it also helps you learn about yourself. I learned why I didn't think I liked Flash or why I thought composite wasn't worth it or why, you know, I, I felt like IPS was dishonest. Um, I am learning about myself more than I, almost more than I'm learning about the, the trade that I'm learning. And that's important too, because you sort of realize, you know, A, I may have been ignorant of this thing. Uh, maybe I had some delusions that were negative about this thing. I was assuming stuff. Uh, maybe I had a bad experience, you know, with someone along the way. And I just discounted all things that related to that my experience. But, you know, that was just my experience. And <laughs> it's just not, it's not fair to judge an entire market or an entire venture uh, based on something that I had a bad experience with. So uh, challenging yourself and trying new things is super important if you're an entrepreneur. Um, and in photography, you know, when people start out, I, I tell them, shoot all kinds of stuff. Don't just do what you like. Don't just shoot cute little kids or don't just shoot really hot models out in, you know, in a park. Like do other stuff. Uh, go to city events, photograph products, which <laughs> kind of uh, hypocritical right now because I haven't yet. Um, you know, try composite editing. Try some rent, some rent equipment if you need to, but try flash photography or maybe shadow a photographer who uses that very well and learn how they do it. And, um, you know, learn from other people. And that kind of brings me on to my next point is never assume that you've mastered anything. You might be the best in Texas at this. You might have the best restaurant. You might be the only person offering this awesome service or product, but don't sit high on that throne and just stay there. Um, look at the big picture of things. Look how you can reach new audiences. You know, learn how you can work out of state or sell your stuff out of state. And then learn how you can reach across the ocean and sell your stuff internationally. Um, that's a really big picture there. And, you know, maybe that's a goal that you might need to reach for, depending on where you are. But never assume you mastered anything. You always need to be learning and moving forwards. Never get stagnant. Next important lesson is to review your past year financially and also how much work you spent into that year. Like, did, did you feel like last year just ran you to the ground? Were you overworking and maybe, or were you under-delivering? Were you over-delivering and wearing yourself out? But also check your numbers. How much money did you make last year? And this is something that I did with Jim Landers that really helped me see a big picture of my photography from last year alone was he had me average up how much money I made per category of photography. So how much did I make on average per wedding? Uh, how much uh, on average per family shoot, per cosplay, per model, whatever. And, you know, just get the raw numbers. And it's, it's probably going to hurt <laughs> unless you've been doing a great job. It hurt me for sure. And I'm thinking, yeesh, I need to change some stuff. And, you know, that's what I'm doing. 
So look at your past year and numbers, and hopefully you keep financial records that are accurate. I highly encourage you to use at least Google Sheets and just keep a running spreadsheet of every time you make money. Uh, it doesn't matter if it goes right back out to bills. Keep a record of how much money you made. And also, with each entry of money you made, write down how much work you did, how many hours, what did you deliver exactly, what products, how many products, um, where did you find the person. That way, uh, if in the future, you can see where you got your leads from, where they referred to you by somebody else. You know, maybe give them a discount as a way of saying thanks. So keeping good, deep records is really important and very, very helpful for, for small businesses or for any business. Um, I mean, if you don't keep good records for a big company, you're probably going to get sued. <laughs> yeah, keep good records and look at them uh, regularly, you know, maybe every season, um, definitely not just every year. So doing that will really help you improve on your next period of business. The next lesson is to set goals to yourself. These might be goals with numbers attached, such as, I want to only work 20 hours a week with my new venture, or I need to make over $3,000 a month to pay all my bills and to support a business. You know, set these goals with numbers so that you can reach them. And if you're not, you got to do something to change that. You might think it's impossible, but you may just not be trying hard enough. You may not be, you know, thinking deep enough and finding new avenues to reach that goal. And don't do this alone. You know, find a Facebook group that has to do something with what you're doing. It might just be a generic entrepreneur group, but it's probably a good idea to find more specific groups of people that are like-minded, maybe that are even in your area, and people, of course, that are willing to share and help others. Uh, I do like international f photography groups because, because I feel like there's no competition because everyone is everywhere, whereas local city groups, there might be a little bit of a mindset of competition or, you know, I don't want to share how I did this or I don't want to say where I got all these clients from because well, everyone else is going to steal it from me. Uh, it's not always uh, an accurate mindset, and you need to promote community over competition. But it's part of the life of a local photographer or business owner. But anyway, get, find a Facebook group and ask questions. Learn from them. Don't be alone in your struggle to, you know, make a business. Uh, find a coach. You might need to pay an accountant or a coach to, to get you up to speed with things legally and financially. It's definitely worth it. Last lesson here is to find out what works for you, but don't get so comfortable in it that you don't do anything new and you don't feel like you ever need to change anything because, well, I'm making money. This thing is profitable. Um, that's great. And do it. You know, run it to the ground, make as much money as you can off of that specialty or that product. But don't get your head in the sand and not see a big change coming like other companies have done when the digital camera craze hit. It wasn't even a craze. It was, you know, it was just a revolution in technology. And a lot of companies didn't see it coming, um, and they went under. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So culture, you know, will change. And we need to change with it, too, sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. There have been plenty of bands that have lasted, you know, 10 plus years, probably up into 30, 40 years, possibly even, you know, old, old rock bands and things like that. And a lot of these bands have lasted, A, because, you know, they've got an iconic sound and people love their, their old songs. But other bands have lasted through more creative avenues, and that is changing their sound. And they're, they're changing with the times and, you know, may, staying relatable to new audiences. That's really important for, uh, for branding and for, for companies that want to last a long time. You've got to stay up with technology. You've got to stay up with the culture and, you know, uh, what people are wanting. And let's look at some companies that did not last a long time. Well, maybe they did at first, but then they came to an abrupt halt because of the inability to change with the culture and with technology. The first one is Blockbuster. I have great childhood memories of going to Blockbuster as well as a local store called Hastings in New Braunfels, uh, renting movies, renting games, awesome stores, love those places. But you know what happened? Streaming. Streaming happened, and they did not jump on the streaming bandwagon. Did you know that the Blockbuster, the owner of Blockbuster saw Netflix as a startup, as a very small niche that would not take off? <laughs> and he actually chose not to sell his company to Netflix later. Um, you know, he just didn't get it, I guess. He didn't see the power of it. And Blockbuster went under. You know, people were not going to stores to rent. They were going online to, to watch stuff on streaming or even to rent stuff online. And because Blockbuster didn't keep up with that, they were left in the dust. Similar to that, Polaroid and Kodak, you know, these companies made film and film cameras for decades, and they did a great job. I mean, they were like the go-to um, earlier in the 19th century. But when digital cameras came out, these companies didn't want to go into the digital route because they thought they would be killing their own product. Uh, and sometimes you have to. <laughs> I mean, I like film. Don't don't get rid of it or anything like that. I'm, not, I'm saying these companies feared internal competition with themselves, which was if they started making great digital cameras, no one would buy their film cameras anymore. 
And unfortunately, that is how markets go sometimes. You need to let go of a product line or you need to start a new one that may at least initially look like it's going to compete with another one. So they didn't make digital cameras, even though investing in it and you know researching it, at least Kodak did. Now they are just struggling to get by. I think um, one of them might have gone bankrupt. You know, they always sell out and some big, massive company buys all their assets and stuff for a few billion. And no one really hears anything uh, from them again. So unfortunately, these companies did not keep up with the digital camera boom in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, and there they are. Toys R Us. Uh, did you know that Toys R Us signed a 10-year deal with Amazon in 2000? So they would be the sole provider of toys for Amazon.com? That sounds like a sweet deal. However, Amazon, I guess, didn't uphold that contract very well and started using other toy dealers on their website, and Toys R Us sued them in 2004. And I guess they broke up that contract, but they didn't bounce back with, okay, well, here's what we're going to do instead. They didn't make a great online presence to compete with Amazon um, or, you know, Walmart.com, things like that. So they went under two, which is really sad because I also have great childhood memories of going to those stores and just walking around, you know, for as long as my parents would let me <laughs> and, and deal with my, you know, asking for everything. Although, honestly, I really just wanted Legos. It's pretty much all I cared about at Toys R Us. I went straight to the Lego section and it would stay there as long as possible. So Toys R Us went under. It's tier tier. Uh, another last company is Compaq with a Q. Compaq. I, don't know, I never really liked that word. Uh, well, they went, they got bought out um, because they weren't doing too well. Other companies like Dell and things like that just overpowered the market with their advertising and their products and, you know, Compaq went under. All right. So as a Photographer myself, I am constantly trying to find ways, and I, I have already found ways, but finding, trying to find new ways of how to set myself apart from my competitors. And also to be aware of things that are changing in the culture. You know, like, I, I don't know, I, I feel like cosplay portraiture was not as big of a thing like 10, 20 years ago. But now it's a huge thing. There are photographers that do just cosplay portraits. And unfortunately, it is more of a hobby. There's not a lot of people that make you know, a living off of cosplay portraits or composites or creative stuff like that. Um, I'm I'm gonna try my hand at doing that. I feel like I have a good uh, good head start. We'll see how that goes. But that's a, kind of a new a newish development in culture is that cosplay has just you know become a, a huge cultural icon. Um, we talked about it in the last episode actually how geeky stuff has become normalized and is much better accepted by the general public uh, just because of entertainment and things like that which is great for people like me because that means I get more geeky, nerdy movies every year, which is awesome. But I am also trying to ride that wave and find ways that I can make profit off of it. You know, of course, without infringing on copyright. But hey, if people like this stuff, I'm going to find a way to provide them images and products that, that back this up and that kind of feed, you know, feed that fire. So the two addendums to this is, A, you don't want to be a fad follower, although fads can be profitable. You need to be careful that you don't write it so long that you fall off the cliff on the other end. When that fad fades and the new one's up you don't know about, you're kind of left into this like, oh, why does no one want my stuff anymore? You know, because, well, that had a short lifespan and now everyone's on to the next new thing. So you need to be aware. Uh, don't get too trapped in fads that you miss the next one. And the next thing is don't buy every new product that comes out. You know, just because mirrorless came out doesn't mean you have to buy it. Mirrorless cameras are awesome. And if you look at the stats and if you read the reviews and they meet your needs that are better than your DSLR, then by all means, go and buy one as long as you can afford it. But just because there's a new lens out or a new product or a new way of lighting your subject, you know, it doesn't mean you have to chase every new product, which is really dangerous. That's called gas or gear acquisition syndrome. And I think it can apply to a lot of different businesses. Try to zoom out, if you will, and see the big picture of things that are coming up and, you know, use them for your benefit. Make sure you're not getting stuck in the past and that you are following things that are profitable and that people want. Uh, continue to challenge yourself and don't assume you know everything. Always be learning and also setting those goals in the future and checking yourself against them, you know, maybe every quarter uh, is really beneficial to keeping your business thriving, not letting it get stagnant and old, and you know, having fun. Um, doing the same thing over and over, I mean, at least for me, gets really boring. I don't like monotony. I don't like equation, you know. I don't like following tradition or equation to, to be profitable. Um, I want to find new ways to do things. And, um, you know, I'm doing my best. So it's always it's a learning experience for everyone involved. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you guys got something out of this jumble of thoughts and ideas from this week. Thanks for listening to the Visionary Variety Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on any of your favorite podcast apps so you won't miss any of the future episodes. We love to hear from our listeners, so if you've got any comments or suggestions for future episodes, please let us know. You can reach us at tvvpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and have a great week.
Somebody on Instagram commented on one of our video clips and said, dope. That's it. (laughs) 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 No, thanks. I'm drug free. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) We are a dope free zone. I don't freak the heck around with dope. (laughs) (laughs) 